Okay. Everybody ready? Yep. So, does everyone have this web page open so far? It's, you can go here. That might be the one you probably have open. So, that's just the description of the course so far, which you've probably already seen. We'll move on to the next page. Um, for the newcomers, you guys have Node installed? So, everyone's all good and set up. Um, so let's recap with what is Node. Node pretty much breaks JavaScript out of the browser and brings it to the desktop. In kind of the same way you use Java and .NET as well. Why should you care? Now, before Node, especially with like web apps, things were pretty uh, quite slow because they ran in a blocking fashion. When you would want to do something, it would stop, it would wait until you got the result, and then it would continue with the execution of the program. With Node, things actually all are asynchronous by default. Um, so it's actually hard to write a slow Node application. Um, now the other one is, for web apps especially, you would have to have a JavaScript developer for the front end, and then you'd have to have a different developer for the back end. Um, and you would also have to use different code between the two. When Node, you get to use the same JavaScript developers for front end and back end. Which is quite good, that's one of the reasons why it's become so popular because we had all these JavaScript developers thinking, gosh, I wish I could code desktop apps. And now they can. And the other one is, for instance, a lot of the tools you use for web development already are quite limited um, because you can't go build, like, say, a web server with PHP. You can't go fly a robot with PHP, right? You can, with Ruby, there are some things like Ruby Motion and Mac Motion to allow you to build native iOS apps and native Mac apps and things like that. But generally, things are quite limited because they were just designed for one particular task, um, which was web scripting. And they lived and then they died, right? They didn't particularly stay alive during the entire website process. Now, the contrast with Node is Node works more like Java in that it can stay alive the entire time and you can interact very heavily with the file system and different things like that or with the hardware in general. So how did this all become possible? The first reason is that is JavaScript. JavaScript is asynchronous by default which allows you, which is good for the DOM because if you have everyone here web developers at least, some not nodding, some confused, <laughs> right? So for the browser, you would want things to happen in asynchronous. So if I click something, then I actually want that to happen. I don't want that to slow down the entire application and block. Um, sometimes I think in the early days of the web, you did actually have things blocking. It was quite horrible. I remember that. Um, but then ever since we've got event handlers and things like that. so. Does everyone know what asynchronous and synchronous are? Good. We've got an intelligent bunch of people. Not that you're not intelligent. If you don't know, I'll explain it. Um, the other side is that it becomes, yeah, it's very easy to do asynchronous and synchronous code. Um, for those who don't know, I'll just recap. The way I like to think about it is that it's kind of like a stream. Synchronous code is like a river. Right, it's flowing, and then when you want to do something else, you curve the river, but it's always in the same flow. When asynchronous, you break off from the main flow and you spawn off a little river, like a sub river or a fork in the river, and then you do your own stuff. That's a pretty good way to think about it. And this pretty much makes it really easy. Now, you don't have to do that many notes because it's all online, um, and you can patch up later. So, I just kind of recap. Now, the big contrast here is let's compare it to PHP. Does what web technologies are people using so far? Are they Ruby developers here or PHP? Ruby. Yeah. I'm old school. I've, I've been doing, I did PHP up until like 2006, and then I moved directly into JavaScript. I'm sorry. Um, I'm hmm? sorry. <laughs> well, Ruby back then was all the hipsters, it wasn't mainstream yet. So it was a bit scary back then. Right. 
Huh? Had a creepy classic ASP scheme into the last of five years. Yeah. ASP always confused me. There's too much magic going on. That's one of the reasons why Ruby confuses me as well. There's a lot of magic. Um, so this is a great example because if we go to PHP, we'll actually say hello, sleep. We will pause here. We will actually wait here until it's finished and then we'll do hello. So that'll sleep for two seconds and then we'll get the world. When here, we actually say, okay, do this. In two seconds, notify me. And then we'll continue on with hello. Right, so we'll actually do hello. We'll go do all of this stuff, pull all of this stuff. And then once two seconds has passed, we'll do world. Does everyone understand the contrast? Fantastic. This is a reading a file. So we'll include the file system module. We'll read this file. Once it's done, we'll alpha this and we will continue on. We'll keep going through the thread until that file is read and then we'll execute that. PHP, we read the file, we wait, we wait, we wait, we get the file contents, we get it there, we continue on. So reading multiple files at the same time is pretty easy. We just go bang, bang, keep going on and then, well, we get the data. And here we have to wait. And example four is creating the web server. Now, if you do PHP, if you know how to create a web server in PHP, you can let me know, but I think it's going to be quite the accomplishment. You'll probably have to write your C stuff and then include it somehow. Now, things to be cautious about when writing this type of code. The first is if asynchronous code scares you, then please do not write synchronous code at the start, like Node does allow you to write some synchronous um, calls because we can do read file sync and that'll perform it in the same way PHP does. But then as soon as you have to do an asynchronous call, your entire application is gonna fall apart because you can't, I, I've done a little demo up and I'll show you what I mean by this. There we go. So if we're writing our app, is that big enough for everybody or do I need to make the text bigger? Fantastic. So we could probably define our class like this and then we do, this is a synchronous version of reading files, like multiple files. This is an asynchronous version. So if we do it synchronous, we'll probably, that's generally the way we would do it. Read a bunch of files and we'll go synchronous. When if we change it to an asynchronous thing, then we have to use the callback. There's no way to do asynchronous and actually do it in a synchronous way, as in get the results back here. Or rather, pause, go, 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 go. Does that sit with everybody? It's a good word of caution. I know because I, I did that. The asynchronous stuff scared me at the start and I had to rewrite my entire application. The other one is things like this gets messy because we've got this. It'll read the first file, it'll read the second file and these could happen, execute at any time. We don't really know. So if we want to do two asynchronous things at once and then once they've completed, move on to something else. So for instance, group asynchronous calls, then we have to be witty or we implement a flow control library because by doing it without a flow control library, we're gonna end up with co some code that looks like this. We have to track how many calls have actually completed. So we get in our array of files, we cycle through our files, we read the first file, once it's, or, or we read whatever file it is, once we read the file, we then have to check whether or not we are the last file that has completed. And then we would continue on with the code. And it's really horrible having to write this. So a lot of people will use really nice um, flow control libraries. A really popular one is async. And that allows you to do the same thing quite nicely. So read these files. Oh, with these files, pass it to pass.exist, get our results back once that is all done. Quick. Yep, sure. Um, so that, so I was going to kind of ask that before. So 
with JavaScript on the browser, yep. um, when, you're, when you wanted to do the kind of flows, you had two options. Um, before jQuery had the, the promise stuff, yep. you had two options. You either nested, you just kept nesting your function, yep. your callback, which is horrible because then you can't separate it, yep. or you throw events all over the place. Yep. And you can only do this once this event's thrown. And, so on. and then jQuery introduced that um, promise stuff. Yep. So is this, is this are, they, are these in async libraries kind of trying to do what the promise stuff is doing? Yeah. Okay. There's, there's, there's hundreds of async libraries. It's one of those areas where people are very opinionated mm. because you can't cram everyone to think about asynchronous code in the same way. Um, so th there's many different ones. Like I even have my own one, which I've used in my projects. And then I discovered this, and I was like, maybe if I knew about this, I'd use it. But so, so that promise, making a promise, and then at the end, that, that doesn't exist in those. It does. Oh, so does. yeah. Okay. Um, async is just the most popular model. Like that, they, they have many. This, see, this is when other people get involved, right? You have all the different ways of doing the asynchronous calls. Um, and yeah, you can always just pick the one that works for you. So it, it, it's a huge area, so you might as well read up on it. Cool. Now, if we go back, yeah, they're the two words of caution before you really get started. Be sure you're aware of those things. Now let's go with Node's ecosystem. So Node was created by Ryan Dow. Um, I think in 2009 it was, and he pretty much wanted to do, get Ruby really fast, he was a Ruby guy, um, and he hated how slow Ruby was. So he looked into the reasons and he discovered it was because it was blocking. And there was no way to actually do asynchronous stuff in Ruby then. I think now there's a few ways you can do it. Um, and he spent like a while trying to come up with a system to actually solve that problem. And eventually he realized he could use JavaScript for it. And he, he spent all his savings, he developed Node, he pitched it, and now it's owned by Joyent. Um, they do cloud hosting for a lot of companies. And, and it's now led by Isaac, <coughs> I think his last name is Schluter. Um, if you guys are better with pronunciation, I'll be happy to hear it. Um, so Isaac actually maintains NPM, which is what you'll use to install node modules. NPM is kind of like Ruby's equivalent to gems. All right, and it's open source, it's located on GitHub. You can actually participate in its future. Um, the core is half JavaScript, half C code, because they would use C code to do the IO and things like that, and then expose it with the JavaScript API. Now, when you're starting to, uh, get with your programming. You execute things just like, you know, maybe PHP, blah, or Ruby, blah. So it's just node, blah. Now, you need a package or JSON file. Um, the reason for this is if you ever want to publish a module, this tells NPM what your, name, your program name is, the versions, things like that. And it also says what dependencies your application uses. This is important because if you don't have a package or JSON file and you decide, okay, I want to go npm install some module, so let's say express, and then you go commit your change and things like that and you push up to GitHub and then someone else clones your project, then if you don't have it in your package or JSON file, then they'll get missing module express, right? So the package JSON file also serves, or at least this section serves to be the same as Ruby's gem file, right? Um, the other areas, so that's just for SEO, this bit here, because you can find all the node modules on the NPM JS website, which is there, there's plenty of them. It's npmjs.org. Um, and these ones, have some meaning. So author is who owns it, maintainers is who maintains it. So the ones you commit actively. And contributors is whenever someone does a pull request, you can add their name and stuff there. This is actually a specific format. It must follow this format. 
or you can specify it with the JSON object. So like, you know, name equals Benj or name colon Benjamin Upton, blah, blah, blah. Um, the string version is a lot nicer. Now this actually serves use. It's visible on the NPM website. You can find out who contributed or what, who did what. Um, and maintainers is also a good way to know who has published access to that module. These aren't the people who actually have it. If you want to add someone, it's actually like npm add owner, something like that. So the Elopton and then like a project. Um, so, but it's a good way to visually see who has published access. Bugs, your issue tracker, repository, where your code's stored. Engines is important. Um, because if you're going to deploy your node program, then you need to be able to tell the hosting provider what minimum version of Node it uses and what minimum version of NPM uses because too often than not, they will run multiple versions or maybe an old version of Node and you always want to ensure your app is going to get the correct version. Now, the reason we actually do greater than is because originally we didn't do it. We just said, okay, 0 0.4, that's all good. But then when 0 0.6 came out and then 0 0.8 came out, everyone whenever you would install something, it would say, sorry, this module doesn't work with no 0.8, right? So now we just say, okay, it should work for all the future versions. It, it may not, but it just makes it so people can actually install things. Now, dependencies, we actually must be pretty strict here because if you just say star, I'll actually get this up. I'll get this example up. So if we actually do star here, or for instance, everything above, let's say version three, then what will happen is in six months when we install our application after a while, there's a new version of Express or there's a new version of Connect that breaks backwards compatibility and your app will be broken. Even if you didn't do any changes, your app's gonna be broken because it depended on something that changed. So you always want to be very specific about the versions you do. We do .x because we allow all revision or patch versions of the module. If we want to be very specific, we would just say that. But generally, we want bug fixes automatically. This convention is a semantic version convention. So if this updates, there's breaking changes. If this updates, then there could be breaking changes, but they're not going to be that bad. If that updates, then it's fine. It's just a bug fix. So it's a good way to get the latest updates without having to always update your package.json file. Dev dependencies um, are not installed when someone does npm install, let's say, express, right? They won't be installed. But if you actually clone out express, um, or let's use one of my projects, for example, because I can show you, right? So if I run npm install inside my node project, and that will install the dependence, the dev dependencies. Because if I'm running npm install in the actual directory, I'm probably doing some development on that module. When, if we're just npm install whatever, then when it won't install the dev dependencies. The reason why you would have dev dependencies is for testing frameworks, compiling your preprocessor, so CoffeeScript to JavaScript, because you don't want your CoffeeScript to be included at runtime. You want your JavaScript to be included at runtime. Um, originally, people did include CoffeeScript originally, and then the node head up people like Isaac and Jeremy Ashkin says, which made CoffeeScript, they said, please don't do this. And they, you're not allowed to do it anymore, it'll actually error on you. Um, directories doesn't actually really have any value right now, um, but it's just a convention we follow. Um, lib is where your files are actually located. Bin, oh. so Docpad is one of my programs, so you'll see references to it every now and then. But if we're writing a module and it has a command line application, then we would want all our command line executables to be listed here. So program, and then it'll point to the actual program. And I'll actually get you up a ex real life example so you can see the comparison. So here's a real one. We've got all our different keywords, the author, all the contributors, the bugs, all the different dependencies. Um, optional dependencies don't matter if they fail. 
So if Growl doesn't work on Windows, so we don't want it on Windows. Airbrake doesn't work on Windows either. So we say we don't care dev dependencies. Our testing stuff, CoffeeScript, where our stuff is located. So out lib, that's the stuff that's included. Our different executables that will be installed. Now, the executable is only available to you if you're doing global installation of Dockpad. Because if you do a local one, then they're just going to be available into your no local directory. They're not actually going to be in your path. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay to say no, I'll, I'll help you if you don't know. Um, scripts are kind of event hooks to particular things during NPM. So you can say publish and then it'll actually say, okay, when this module is published, run this script, or when it is installed, run this script. Um, this one is, for instance, when we test. So if I run npm test, then I'll actually run all the unit tests, which is quite good. And main is when we require a module, this is the file it should include. So if I do, do it, require docpad, then it is actually including this file in the docpad directory. Now we'll go back. Now the npm.js website has all the meanings for this and a lot more stuff that I didn't actually mention. Now if you're writing a private application, you don't ever want this released to the public, be sure to add private true. So if the if Docpad was for say for instance an internal project, I'd add private true. And that will ensure that if anybody actually runs npm publish or attempts to publish it, it will actually err on them. So to recap as well, you install modules by npm install. That install it into your local directory, into a node modules directory. You require like this. That will install the main, which was listed here, or it require the main file. And if you have command line applications or executables, then you have to do the global install. Now, we've talked about the semantic versioning rules. If you want to discover modules, if you're new to Node.js, then the Node GitHub Wiki page has an exhaustive listing of modules. There are so many, um, which is good and bad at the same time. Bad because you don't know whether or not the author is actually maintaining it or whether or not it works. So if you ever look at a module, be sure to check whether or not it has actually is being maintained, whether people are contributing a lot. And check for one of these. This is integration with Travis CI to indicate, okay, yes, this project is actually passing its unit test. That's a good indicator. The next thing to check is which version of Node it actually runs against. Um, the way to do that is probably check the travis.yaml file, which Travis is what we use for the testing. It will say it there, but you can also check the package.json file. Um, who uses Travis here? Anyone? So Travis is open source. Um, you can use it for anything, any type of language and system. And it integrates with GitHub really nicely. So whenever you push a change, it'll run your tests for the project automatically. And you can see, and you'll get an email when it actually passes or if it fails, which is really nice. And it will reflect on your GitHub wiki page. So I think async. Oh, they don't have one. Oh, don't trust them then. <laughs> All right. Um, the next thing is bundled dependencies. <coughs> Yeah. So just going back to the package file now before we carry on. Yeah. So if I was writing a node program that just wrote to the console, yep. I would need a package.json, right? If you use any dependencies, you would. Okay. Because you want okay. Yeah. It, does you need it, you absolutely need it if you have dependencies or if you're going to publish the module. Right? Because that's how you declare your dependencies. Yeah. Because that's the only way you know will know. Yeah. Now, the other caution, 
So we talked about the version caution. The other caution is bundle dependencies. Um, if you really want your Node app to be like incredibly stable or if there is a recursive dependency or a circular dependency, so if I include something and then that something includes me, then you would actually want bundle dependencies. What bundle dependencies will do is when you publish the application, then it will actually publish the node modules directory for that as well. Um, the caution here, that's all fine and good, but the caution is do not use bundle dependencies with C modules that are compiled because if you install it on Windows, well, if you publish your bundle dependency on Windows and then you try and install it on a Mac, it's gonna fail because it's a different architecture. You probably won't ever come across this um, unless you're trying to do advanced stuff, but it's better to be aware of it than to stress out. So, um, can you about um, installing uh, a package yep. um, locally or globally? Yep. Yeah, so generally that would depend on the way Node is installed. Do you have Node available to everybody in your computer? No, just not. Yeah, so then even if you install it globally, it's still only going to be available to you. Um, generally, local installs you use to require it into your application. Global installs is just to run binary executables. Um, how do you install them differently? Um, just with the dash G. So if I do npm install docpad, that one's installed locally with dash G, that one's installed globally. Define locally and globally. So locally, we'll go into NPM modules. I'll show you, I'll install something that's lightweight. Let's go with One. Hopefully that's lightweight. Right, so that's installed it and it's installed it into a local directory, so inside node modules. So, but if we do npm install g, then it'll actually ins install it into our global directory, um, which will be user slash local something something something. So you're Yeah. And then, but if you just want to run the app, you just want to go. Yeah, a good one would be Coffee Script. So, if you want to get access to Coffee, see, I don't actually have it installed globally, right? When if I installed it globally, then I would go like that. And then make sure it's closer. So, get the coffee. Yeah, well, you can do them both at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Um, but. So, yeah, so now I can run coffee. Yeah. Speaking of coffee script, um, if you're like me and you really hate, oh, I know a good way to explain this. Sometimes with Node, you'll end up with code that looks like that because you want to keep going down the loop. Um, and you'll end up with a lot of these. And sometimes you may forget a parenthesis or do the wrong one. Pretty annoying. Um, so CoffeeScript is an alternative out there so you don't have to write all the stuff. Does everyone know CoffeeScript? Cool. I'll get the, um, I'll just show you what that would actually compile to. So CoffeeScript compiles to JavaScript. That's the JavaScript on the left, that's the CoffeeScript on the right. Um, it looks a lot like Python, um, and it, it includes a lot of syntactic sugar. So instead of doing for loops, um, which you know you have to do var i da 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 da, you can just really do that quite nice. It includes a bit of syntactic sugar. Some people like it, some people hate it, which are kind of the purists and then the new age people. Um, and on that callback hell, um, using like an async library. Way to do yeah, uh, is another way. Um, the the main benefit of CoffeeScript is just 
it's just preference if you don't want to write all the braces um, so moving on now we'll start to fiddle with some node now I've got a link up there on the board the node.zip link um, has everyone downloaded their examples right um, so we can actually fiddle with this uh, I'll just show you the link just to be careful so get the examples go here download that and then you'll have all the examples that I'll be running in this course so if we go Good. So, if you want to do this with me, that'll be awesome. Um, so that's just run that code. I've got that in a basic server basic.js file. And what it's done is it's just created the server at localhost and then 8000. So we'll try that out. Hello world! Which is really cool. So every single time I do a request, it will actually fire this code here. It can handle like say a thousand requests and it'll just go bang, bang, bang and start off its own asynchronous thing. So its own fork in the river. Um, we can test that by the command line by doing curl. So, hello world. Now, to illustrate the asynchronous and non-blocking abilities, we'll get a server with a pause. Right. Now, if we do the same thing, we'll get hello, and after two seconds, then we'll actually get the result, which is world. Now the important thing here is when it's doing set timeout, we aren't actually waiting, right? Well, we're not blocking. We can still do other things. So if we do two things at the same time, then we both get them back, which is cool. And if you don't believe me, then you can run Apache Bench. And what will this do is we'll do 100 requests and 100 at the same time to that little, tiny little server. And we'll see that instead of it waiting for each request, every request just takes two seconds, which is what we wanted. Does that make sense? Fantastic. Now, echo server is when it's going to get interesting. So an echo server is just like, you know, you're in the mountains, you say something and you hear it back. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. So for here, we want to use netcat. Netcat's kind of like telnet, so you can actually chat. We'll get our hello world, which is right here, and then Whenever I want to say, you know, whenever I write something or wherever the server receives data or that connection receives data, then we want to give it back to them and yell at them. So, right. And we can have that with multiple things. Now, the reason why these don't interact with each other because Socket just is that one connection here. It is in all of the different connections. Now, we'll move on to a more advanced example, which is a chat server. So we get our hello world. And then when we get data, we want to write to every single socket that is in our own. And we'll say, hello. And the other person will get it.
Now, if we want to wonder, you can try this. Maybe NC Try that and we'll see if you can actually connect to me. No? Maybe that one then. having success or not. Nope. Oh, that's going to make it a lot less fun. Maybe. We'll work on this. It will be fun. What do I do if I don't have Netcat or... Um, you can use Telnet. Um, Mac should already have them installed. Oh. Um, maybe I think you can get like a Telnet client, but that's just for this example. We'll move on to a different thing. I don't think that's going to be a successful thing, but the next example when we move on will. Um, and then, yeah, when we end, then we actually remove it from the socket. Now, if we just do like delete sockets and then dash i, then we're going to have a problem with the thing because that's just JavaScript. Now, let's move on. And one of the most common things you'll want to do is probably serve some files with Node.js. So we will want to create a web server that actually serves stuff. Did everyone get that example working good on their local machine though? Yeah. You got a yes? No. Okay. Okay. Do we have time? How many people had problems? Raise their hands. Okay, we've got some. Okay. I'll help you afterwards and I'll give you the magic as well if you want to come to me after the class. Hey ben, look around just quickly. You know, yep. go back to the server pause one. Yep. Um, so it's not blocking, right? Yep. Yep, so it outputs hello, yeah. um, and then it will actually keep the connection open. It keeps the connection open until we do end. Yeah, this, this is important when we actually code a real web server because you want to make sure you always end your connections, otherwise those connections will stay open and your server will run out of memory. It happened. <laughs> um, so be aware of that. Now, We'll do a static file server. This is us doing it all up locally um, and not using any modules yet. So the way this will work is we've created our server and whenever we get the URL, so the path name will be like you know, whatever's afterwards. So for instance, the path name here is slash learn, blah, blah, blah. And we just add our path here, which we configured, which is our current directory, or not the CWD, but the directory of this file. And we'll check if the path exists. If it does, 
then we'll read the file and give the data back. Now, if it doesn't exist, then we'll output 404 not found. So if we do this as an example, we've got our 404. Now, if we do it with a file that actually exists, oh, why? Oh, maybe that doesn't exist. Okay, I have to update the docs, but static echo. Okay. There we go. So that file actually is there. So just output it our echo server. And, you know, it is fast, which is good. So if that was PHP, we'd actually wait here then we'll wait after the read file and we'll keep waiting. And then that would block all the other connections that happen at that time. Now, this isn't secure, never do this because people could then be quite nasty and then do something like, okay, what's in my parent directory? See? So they can get stuff outside the current directory. Um, by being nasty. Now, if we want to start doing abstractions, now we actually want to, naturally, if we're running an app, this is going to get pretty big if we keep doing everything nesting. It's going to look like the callback hell example. Um, so what we want to do is we actually want to write readable code or code that we can actually abstract out and modularize. So we've moved the stuff into a handle files function here that's the only change we've done right now so we've got var handle files and that's just a way to remove the nesting just instead of doing an anonymous function a function that doesn't have a name instead then we give it a name and we move it out that's one way of dealing it with it however we're going to end up with a gigantic javascript file after a year right it, it's not going to look pretty so then what we would actually do is this description? Oh, I've jumped ahead. Yes, this one will still have callback hell because if we want to do something here, for instance, this is the stuff we actually want to abstract out, the reading of the file. However, we want to customize this bit because if the file isn't found, maybe we want to do something else, right? So we would actually have to just modify this with this approach. But this is when the asynchronous flow stuff comes in because the way we would do it is through a little callback. In Node, the callback is always the last argument. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to call our handle file stuff, which is abstracted out. And then we pass over what we want to do if the file isn't found, right? So we call handle files, we'll go in here, run through, if the file isn't found, then instead of handling the request, it would actually call our callback and then would jump over here and continue on. Does everyone understand this? It's kind of just like event handlers in jQuery, um, except you don't actually use events, it's just callbacks. Now, Dr. Benny, when you say the, the callback's already last, it's, that's just a convention, right? Yes, it's, it's a good convention. Because, uh, I'll tell you why. Because if I'm writing something, for instance, set timeout, right? If we have the function first, console.log, hello, right? And then we have to do our delay here. It's just ugly. And if we actually want to write, because if we have tons of stuff and this function is really big, you may not actually see this. Um, so a little good hack to do is to, I'll move to CoffeeScript right now so you can actually see this even better. So if we did this in CoffeeScript, then in CoffeeScript, it would have to look like this. Right? When, if it was nicer, if the callback was the first argument, then we could actually just do this. I mean, if the callback was the last argument, and the delay was the first, we could do that. 
and isn't that nice right so you can just add everything there so the little trick there is just to go like wait delay callback on next right and that'll accomplish the same purpose and then we can just do wait Mahaha. um so that is how we abstract stuff out we can do different callbacks with different things um and like you know just add as many arguments as we want if we have different stuff but generally you just want one callback and it should be the last the other convention here is errors should always be the first argument of the callback that's returned so we call next the error should always be first if we have an error go back to next rather than throwing the error here this allows us to safely handle errors the way we want to handle errors in your real life application you won't be throwing stuff you'll be logging it you'll be handling it correctly right you don't want your application to crash when you do a throw error right you want your application to stay alive as long as possible um, at the end of this presentation, I have some links to explain this convention a lot more um, and why we do it. Now, so yeah, return now if there is no error. Sorry, I've got another question. Yep. Sorry. Um, so you wouldn't just like try catch there in the create server? That's not convention. That's bad. Do not use try catch. Okay. The reason is if you're using modules and then you've got to try catch, right, then that cache could catch anything, mm -hmm. right? You, yeah, okay. you'll quickly end up in no man's land. Um, so that we'll talk about that. Now, the problem here then is we still got the problem of one JavaScript file. It's still going to be ridiculously big. Oh, I didn't actually do that. I left it as like a little explanation. That's why I skipped over it. So what we'd actually do is we'd output this into its own file. We'll copy that, put it into its own file. And then we would include it by doing require. So we'll put it into handle files. We then, inside our handle files directory, or I mean file, I'll show you what this would look like. I'll do it on the other side. So we'd abstract the handle files out. Just be like, boom. Then at the end, the way we do it is by module.exports. So whenever we do something with require, at, or whenever we do a Java, a node file, generally, if you want that to ever be required by something else, you do module.exports handles files. And that would then mean in our other file, right, what this will then become like that but generally you don't want the extension there you just want just handle files the reason you exclude the um, extension is because um, if you're compiling, say, from CoffeeScript to JavaScript, sometimes you want the CoffeeScript file included, sometimes you want the JavaScript. And it just looks nicer without the extension. Does that make sense to everybody? How you would abstract out that portion? Now, essentially, what we did here is, like, surely we're not the only person who wanted to do a static file server. We're not the only one who wanted to serve files. So there's a project called Connect. It's incredibly popular. Um, it was done by TJ Holloway Chuck now. Um, at the beginning, now it's owned by Censure. Um, they do XTJS and Censure Touch. Um, they're really big in the JavaScript world. Um, and what they would allow us to do is to include Connect. We've still got our configuration just like before. And then we have a little static middleware which says okay do all the static file serving here then what this would do with this static file path it's essentially just the same as me saying okay handle files I could pass the handles files which we did over here 
um, just to there. And then when it triggers next, if it does trigger next, then we'll continue on to the next thing, right? And then say, for instance, if I wanted to flow on to the next thing here, I'll just pull next again. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, the nifty thing here is essentially what we did with handle files is this is called a middleware in no conventions. Um, so it what it does is it can just go in the middle anywhere inside our actual server. So we can say, okay, put that here, but maybe we want to put some routes earlier on, so we'll put some routes. Um, now, connect is something you probably want to learn, but in reality, you may use an actual web framework. The most popular is called Express. Um, and again, it's made by this TJ Holloway Shark guy. Um, there's a lot of Node big players in the open source world. Joint, they made Node. Learn Boost, do Express. Um, they do Mocha, which is a testing framework. They do Commander. They, like, they do so much stuff. They just do like open source Node all the time. Cloud9, they do the online IDE, which is really nifty. They do a lot of Node stuff as well, which is open source, but their stuff is more like enterprise stuff, like really detailed. Nojitsu do Node.js hosting, and they do a lot of nifty stuff for command lines and deploying stuff. And if you want to do Node server stuff, they do it, and ourself as well. So we do stuff um, related to maybe a lot of command line stuff as well, as well as a extension to web servers so you can render templates really easily. That project's called Docpad. So if you want to start using CoffeeScript or Jade or Haml or Stylus or SAS, um, Docpad has you covered there. Now, if we're using Re Express, our most basic Express app will look like this. So we require Express. We um, then create an instance of our application. And then we have a route now. So now we're getting into routing. So whenever we get the index page, we just send hello world, Joe, like we've done before. And we'll listen on port 8000. Now, an important thing to note here is this isn't actually a server, even though it's got listen here. This is actually an express instance. The reason why this is important is sometimes you will actually want to pass over the server instance to a different module um, when if passing over the express instance will fail. Sometimes they're like express, sometimes they're like the normal server. An example of this is socket IO, which we'll use later. Now, if we do go back to our static server, it'll look like that. So pretty much exactly the same. We've got some more power here because we can do all our routing and stuff up here as well. But Express kind of aliases or the connect middleware, so we still have static there and we continue on. Now, the nice thing here is if we go back to connect, it's very basic, it works pretty much the exact same way as the node HTTP server, but we have the abstraction benefits, right? We still have to say res or static code equals 404. When Express, it gives us a nicer syntax, right? And it's a lot more powerful to handle our cookies, our sessions, things like that. It's what you want to build web apps with. There's a few other web frameworks, but they're not as popular and they go about things quite differently. Um, so now we'll get on to, I have to scroll up. Go on to something that's pretty nifty. Um, so now we'll actually code a web server with Express. And what we'll do is, yep, we'll do our static stuff. We'll serve whatever our HTML file is here, which is defined here, and 404. But we will do some sockets. So back when we did our telnet um, stuff, our little chat stuff, we did it via just the basic command line stuff. When if we want to do stuff in the browser, then we use a pro project called Socket.io, which is by LearnBoost. Um, now, what this allows us to do is send data in real time between the client, the web browser, and the actual server. So when this connects, we'll emit the object news into, well, we'll emit the event news, send it the data, and we'll get that into the browser. And then we'll submit that back into 
command line and this is nifty this is when like no goes like whoa because with ruby or anything else you generally would use i think it's like push.com or something like that pusher pusher.com if you want to add real-time abilities to your web app when node you can do it directly with node right so the best example for this would be a chat server which we've gone up and done which is real nice no oh, wait chat server oh okay that example is an updated but in the download you will have the latest one you will have the chat server which is there so i'll move that over to the left and we'll get that up so socket.io is a client side library for real-time communication but it only works with node.js on the server yeah so it doesn't work with like any like php or ruby no there are ports people have tried it but you're going to end up with that blocking problem with other languages so we've got a web server up now Okay, good question. Glad you asked. There's a package so JSON file in there, run npm install into that directory, and that'll install the modules. Because connect, express, socket are all third party modules. They're not included with Node by itself. Did npm install do stuff? Sweet. Huh? Uh oh. Oh, did it say you've got an invalid package.json? There's a syntax. Okay, for you guys, you got online, you download it before I fix that problem. There's just a syntax problem in there. Yeah. Um, I'll just pop around right now and fix that up so you guys can join in and have fun. Oi, you already skipped the head. You're good. All right, and for yourself? Yeah. All right. So it's just saying here, I've got a comma. That's another reason. Now we didn't alias anything, we're still just doing our static server. It would help if I ran it again. There's our chat client. So if I write hi, no, something's going wrong. Just do npm install express. I'll do this up here. Anyone who's having problems, run this. And that'll install the necessary modules. And that's based on that JSON package, it's not in the dependencies, is that right? Yeah. I think maybe I have something else running. Let me check. Oh, of course. I'm running the wrong file. Chat server. There we go. Goody, 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 goody. And 
there we go. So what it allows us to do is have the real-time abilities in our app. Now, before, this was really, really hard to do because you had to do Ajax calls and then getting data from the server back to the client was very hard, mm -hmm. right? Um, when now it is as easy as just writing, you know, a little socket thing. Whenever we receive a message, emit that message back to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then here, so when we get, do I enter, emit our message, right? Send that to everybody. Um, and whenever we, we receive a message, that will be here, something on message, add that to our thing. Everyone use jQuery? Good, good. So, if you guys are really tempted, we can either take questions now or you can extend that chat server into something a lot more nifty. Now, if you have like a week or so, what you can actually come up with Actually, it wouldn't really take you that long. But you can come up with a chat app like this in pretty much next to no time. Right? We get it. We can change our names and things like that. Add gravitas. Bam. And then everyone updates, and it's really nifty. Um, this example is actually online. I hope it's still online. There we go. If you can go there, we can all participate in a chat. If it loads. Nope. Maybe. No, it's down. I did that up quickly last night. But now we'll take questions and I hope for anyone one on one if you'd like um, before we close these are great things to add to your chat if you're new to Node and you, and you don't feel that confident with it these are more step by step instructions that you can use to get started chat rooms is pretty nifty you can find instructions on that on the Socket.io website um, you can add things like that um, Pre-processor support, so SAS, whatever, add relative times, markdown, WebKit notifications. It's all pretty easy to do. Um, I'll say thank you. Um, and if you want to get more notifications when I do another train like that, you can enter your details there. Follow me if you like me. Or maybe even if you don't and you don't like people, you can do that. Um, these are great talks if you're confused or anything. Learn these, introduction with Node. That kind of covers what I've talked about tonight, but you get to see it from a different angle. Invented Ruby, we'll talk about doing this type of stuff with Ruby and the challenges um, which are faced and why you would use Node.js. Um, and programming styles by Crockford. Um, I just thought this was really nifty because it talks about the different programming styles you'll see with Node then a lot more stringent. You see people use CoffeeScript, you see people use many different conventions. Um, nifties. No copter is flying robots with Node.js with the AR drone. It's pretty darn nifty, this videos. Um, you can learn about session middlewares here, um, exception handling in Node, and debugging and profiling in Node here. Now, I ideally would have liked to include this in this talk, but then this talk would have went for an entire week. Right, these are all big subjects. Um, modules that, if you want to get started with different things, these are the ones that I personally use and I like a lot. Um, nifty thing with JavaScript on the server, you can start doing nifty things. For instance, this is CoffeeScript to render HTML. So you can actually start embedding um, logic inside the actual HTML, which is pretty nifty. It's pretty out this stuff, but if you've got a while and you, you're tempted, start experimenting. Echo is just like um, 
your general templating engine. It's pretty simple. It's made by 37 signals. So if you want to do stuff, do it like that. Um, and then stylus is kind of like SAS, but it's built with Node, this coffee script. If you want to use these things, Docpad will render it, will render them for you, which is quite nice. And it'll help you get started a bit faster. Um, for testing, you can use these. Mocker is also another popular one, but I've always had trouble with Mocker. Um, asynchronous ways you can do there, the different servers, configuration files, so that's CoffeeScript, notation for configuration files, so you don't have to have a missing comma error or an extra comma error um, ever again. Different utilities, so underscore and backbone work on the browser, and because they don't really interact with the DOM that much, they run perfectly on Node. If you've got JavaScript stuff on the browser that doesn't need the DOM, you can just copy and paste that onto Node and it'll work beautifully. Um, so underscore is a great example for that. You'll probably use underscore a fair bit. Request pulls in data from other places. If you're wanting to write command line stuff, commander.js will help you define, okay, when they type docpad run, go to this function. That'll help you there. Um, Caterpillar will help you actually get um, output messages to the console pretty nice. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, guys. If you want any help, we've got another 20 minutes or so, but I'll probably hang around later as well. And yeah, if you've got everything there that you need to get started now, you know how to publish node modules, you know how to do um, sockets with a web browser, which is really nifty. So for the Java example, how you're saying, how could I implement this at work? You could implement a Node.js um, application with Socket.io to do that real-time stuff with your website, right? So if you've got a Java web server, then you can drop your node thing, like the chat application, and then connect the sockets to your node server instead of your Java app, and then you'll be able to get real-time abilities, which is real nifty. All right, cool, so thank you. Cool, <laughs>
single thread by default. Yeah, yeah. That's the limitation of V8. If V8 changes that, then Noble will probably get it. Yeah. But it works well because you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And it's not really an issue because worrying, not worrying about threads and having non-blocking is probably going to be better than having threads and having to worry about blocking and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Now, for this chat server, if you guys want to fiddle with that, you can clone that out and get running right away. And that's available here. And it's got the instructions for you. So that's like what's possible. This was done a year ago with um, Backbone when it was like 0 0.5. So it's nifty to show what's possible in a very short time, but the source isn't commented and it's, it, it was a fun weekend project. Um, but yeah, the, the only other thing I can say is, yeah, just have lots of fun. Um, and yeah, be sure to check out Docpad. It will help you um, build Node web servers a lot easier because we do like live reload. We'll compile CoffeeScript and you can do, for instance, I'll show you. Like the Beverly website is built with it and all of this stuff, it's just like all of this is just markdown files where that's rendered to HTML and then all of this listing um, back on learning is all generated automatically, really easy. Don't have to do any server-side code for it, pretty much. Also, Docpad does it on the fly? Um, Pro server-side was wrong, uh, but you do it just in your templating because it will read all the files, pass it to an in-memory database, and that way, it's kind of like building websites, but instead of using a database, you can just use the local file system. Mm -hmm. Generate your website, um, kind of in the same way Jekyll will do it. So you get a static website, and then you can, you know, serve that quite well. And that's quite good because, you know, this can then handle, like, say, 4,000 requests a second, like, easy, right? So because it's just serving static files. But if you want dynamic files, we can do that too. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. Oh, that, oh, that Yep. Um, every request is a single thread, that's fine. Yep. But as new requests come in, are they separate threads? No. So it's still the same. Still the same. Okay, yeah. So the whole thing is just running one thread. Yep. yep. Uh, but then, so as, as you've got those non blocking calls there, every time you start something, uh, does that thread get given to something? Um, yep, so it works the same just like JavaScript in the browser. So if you're doing stuff, like synchronous stuff, then it'll keep doing that. Yep. Um, and then as soon as it's got a pause, like it's run out of stuff to do, it'll move on to the next event right. that should run. And that could be either in the same request or a different request? Yeah, could be anything. Right, cool. But it would generally do it in order, right? right? Yeah. So, anybody want any help? I'll help you out. Just a side question. Yep. I saw you like, did the tool to go on there. You were bringing up the fan font from. Oh, yes. Sorry, what was this doing? Um, that's Total Terminal. Oh, okay. Um, that's pretty cool. Yes, it's so good on the laptop. I don't use it on the iMac, though, because iMac's ginormous. But yeah, that's Total Terminal. Oh, this thing's Divi, the thing that I use to go like. Pow, pow, pow. Um, D I V Y. Yeah. Yeah. So unlike the browser, <laughs> where everything is in the same namespace, yeah. every file is its own namespace. So if I have my little chat server here and I do, actually, I'll get you up some real examples. All right, what would be a good, good one? Let's go with Docpad. Well, actually, let's go with Bally Tool. So if I define all these different things up here, um, they won't be exposed to any other file than this one. Um, actually, I'll get the JavaScript so you guys can be more familiar. So anything that's you know done 
everything's namespace. Even if I didn't have this function here, um, then everything's still just located to that file. That's why you have to do require. That's why you have to do module.exports. So nothing shares the same namespace. Um, if you do want to be like evil, you can use like the global object. Um, and then that would define a global that's available everywhere. But I've only had to do that once, and that was because some app didn't work and I had to do something nasty to it. So. so when you build a website like your website you showed us, yep. um, like Express is a web framework. So do you guys, the Zoom does not implement MVC in any way? Or do you guys implement that pattern or not really? Or? Yep. Um, so Express is a very basic framework. It doesn't include the database. Like, you know how Rails includes like everything, yeah. right? Um, all it does is just includes the route. So you can say, okay, when I do something, guide would be a better example. So it gives us a routing, it gives us the session work, things like that. Um, and the nice middleware. So pass our body, so do forms, allow us to do routes, add our routing as well. The other stuff, um, and then handle our different types of errors and things like that. Now, for MVC, um, there are more involved frameworks, like there are frameworks that try to be Rails and Node. Um, they're not as popular because um, Node is very, I guess, trying to do things differently than the other languages because it has these new abilities. Um, so we're trying to take advantage of that as much as possible. Um, now, if you, you know, you can include Mongo and then put that into backbone models and then you get your models and things like that, which is really good. Like Docpad um, is actually powered by backbone um, in the background as well. So, you know, it reads everything, passes that into a backbone model, then you can query your backbone stuff real nice. Um, you can also do many um, you know, use Mongo, use Redis, whatever you want. Now, unlike a year ago, we actually have drivers for databases. Right. <laughs> when, um, you know, back then we really didn't. So, okay. no, it's quite stable now, which is good. Yeah. Did everyone get that chat server up and running? Okay. Cool. I'll go to help. Yeah. Oh, and there's also links for you to rate the talk as well. Um, there's links for general assembly. Um, they would have sent you an email to perform it, go to the feedback um, as well. And as well, if you like me, you can rate myself here on speaker rate as well. So I'll leave that up. That's cool. That's cool.